We read in John 12, verse 21, Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And that's the title of our current Bible study series here at Duluth Bible Church. And it seems so appropriate that on the heels of a study of Jesus' love for all sinners, which highlighted religious Nicodemus in John 3, and the immoral Samaritan woman in John 4, that we now wish to see Jesus next in his preaching on hell. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I confess to you that I am conflicted today. I'm conflicted in teaching a study on hell such as this. On the one hand, I embrace the absolute justice of God and how God would fail miserably to be a thrice holy God if he did not punish those who have broken his laws and violated others in so many sinful and horrible ways. Yet the description we will see today of hell is so horrific, and it's eternal to boot. On the other hand, I rejoice today in God's incredible love for you and me, and in the amazing message of the gospel of grace, and how God himself provided the one and only way of escape through Jesus Christ for lost sinners from a hell we deserve to a heaven that we don't. Now you might be thinking, if seeing today Jesus preaching on hell is difficult, why do it? Well, actually, there are several reasons why one should be compelled to study on this subject. First of all, it's because it's a, it's a biblical subject. Hell is mentioned many times in the Word of God, in both the Old and New Testament, though it is seldom preached on in churches today. How many pulpits are preaching today? and making no reference ever to hell. But as a pastor, I can either be popular with people, or I can be faithful to God and his word. And God has spoken, and he hasn't stuttered when Paul wrote, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these words. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having ears that want to be tickled. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And thus, if I am to be faithful to the Lord, I must teach the whole counsel of God, including on the subject of hell. Secondly, the subject of hell is an important subject. Not only because it's biblical, but because it relates to its effects upon other subjects, such as the eternal destiny of people, the immortality of the soul, the importance of Christ's death, the justice and love of God, and so forth. Can you think of anything more important than the subject of your eternal destiny? And yet many never preach on it, even if they believe in it, for fear of being viewed as negative and offensive, and it doesn't address, quote, felt needs. And frankly, when I was 18 years old, I thought I had the world by the tail, I had everything in place, I was going to college, I was going to play football, da 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 da. And someone opened a Bible and showed me that if I wasn't saved, I was going to hell, and I said, I have a need. It wasn't a felt need, but it was a real need. For if you are not saved here today, God wants to warn you to flee the wrath to come. Thirdly, this issue can be a confusing subject. You know, there's words like sheol, the Hebrew word for the grave, or the lowest parts of the earth. The word Hades, which is simply the counterpart to sheol in the New Testament. There's the word Tartaru or Tartarus, the angelic prison for select demons involved in the Genesis 6 diabolical plan to pollute the bloodline of the Redeemer. And then there's the word Gehenna, 
Jesus' term of preference for eternal hell, also known in the book of Revelation as the lake of fire. And without some biblical clarity, this subject can be confusing. Fourthly, this subject is a practical subject with great implications and applications regarding salvation, missions, evangelism, daily godly living, and so forth, as more than 150,000 people will die today on the planet. 4.5 million will die this month, and more than 55 million will die this year. And if there's no eternal hell, why preach the gospel? Why is... What's there to be saved from? Why evangelize? Why go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Why would Jesus tell us to do this? It would all be a big waste of time. Fifthly, it is a rejected subject today. As there has been a growing rejection of the classical Christian viewpoint on hell in favor of universalism. Everyone ultimately goes to heaven. Pluralism. There's more than one way to go. Annihilation, you just cease to exist. Or post-mortem salvation, the doctrine of you get a chance later after you die. And frankly, dear friends, many people reject the biblical concept of hell totally. In a poll that I was reading not long ago, 81% of adult Americans believe in heaven. 80% fully expect to go there when they die. 61% believe in hell in some form, but less than 1% think it's likely they're going to go to hell. It reminds me of Romans 3. They have no fear of God before their eyes. But this rejection of the biblical viewpoint on hell has been fueled by such books as The Shack or Rob Bell's book, Love Wins. In fact, have you heard of these books? In fact, one's been made a movie, at least, already. You see, there's this view of what's called universalism or ultimate reconciliation. (coughs) And it's a teaching that says that every human being at some point will ultimately be reconciled to God because Jesus died for everyone, satisfying God's justice. Each person will, either in this life or the next, be won over by God's love and spend eternity with him. Now that's an ear-tickling false teaching, and it's wishful thinking, which is out of sync with what Jesus himself taught on the subject of hell, as we'll see today. Ironically, while there is this great cry in our day for social justice, for those who have been violated, few want to face their own sin and unbelief and ultimate accountability to God, For his just judgment for violating his holy standards. Furthermore, the subject of hell is being redefined. Even in evangelical circles, the word destroyed is redefined. Eternal is redefined. Hell is redefined. (coughs) Redefining the concept that while hell is forever, the punishment of the lost in hell is not forever. In favor of some form of annihilation or universalism. And beware, these false teachers use the same vocabulary you and I use, but they use a different dictionary, defining terms differently than what we understand the Word of God to be saying. But because of all of this, this becomes a very emotional subject. A difficult reality to embrace embrace that can create angst and heartbreak and turmoil in one's soul when considering one's own eternal destiny or the ultimate destination of others who are lost, especially those whom you love. Kind of reminds me of the little book in Revelation 10 that John eats. And as he eats this little book, he says it's sweet to the lips, but when it gets down into the soul, as it were, it's bitter. And you know, to know of God's wonderful love and plan of salvation is sweet to the lips. But to know that there's going to be people who are lost forever can be bitter to the soul. Furthermore, it's become a trivialized subject. With the word hell spoken frivolously and frequently, with hardly any usage directed towards the biblical place called hell, did you hear the word hell this week? 
Probably you might have used it yourself. What the hell? Or who gives a hell about it? Or even worse, you hear people say, go to hell. I heard it on sports radio talking about hell. But no reference to Jesus Christ, of course. And not used in a biblical way. It's trivialized. But I will tell you this, it directly impacts you as a believer or unbeliever. One of the greatest reasons to be saved is you don't want to go to hell. One of the greatest motivations to preach the gospel to others is not only the love of Christ, but as ambassadors for him, proclaiming this message before it's too late. For now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If someone was in a house that was on fire, would you not want to save that precious soul before it's too late? This impacts us in our daily life if we embrace the biblical truth of it. And you know, I might add to that that this concept of hell was preached on by Jesus more than anyone else in the Bible. I checked it out again this week. It's true. And he defined it as a place of conscious, eternal punishment for the lost that God, by his grace, wants to save you and me from. But that shouldn't surprise us that Jesus would talk about it so much. For Luke 19.10 reminds us that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you're going to embrace the real Jesus, the biblical Jesus, not one made after your own fantasy and fiction, then you're going to have to embrace the reality that Jesus Christ believed in hell, he preached in hell, about hell, and he came to save us from a hell we deserve to a heaven we don't. Now, in examining the teachings of Jesus Christ today, as recorded in the New Testament, you might wonder, well, what does the Old Testament teach about hell and salvation? And frankly, not a lot. An introductory but limited view of hell which will be developed later in detail through the progressive revelation of the New Testament. The Old Testament mentions Sheol as the grave, or even worse, the underworld, a place to be feared and avoided, a place of God's wrath, as well as a place for the unsaved and in, or, or even the redeemed. But keep in mind, as we think of the Old Testament, there aren't many references to individual salvation or personal justification in the Old Testament. Genesis 15, 6, Psalm 32, 1, Habakkuk 2, 4, Isaiah 45, verse 22. Not a lot of verses on personal salvation. Why? Because the primary thrust of the Bible beginning in Genesis 12 through Malachi is on the national salvation of the nation of Israel from the curse and its enemies involving the eventual setting up of God's kingdom on earth through the Messiah. And that's the message that John the Baptist and Jesus and the disciples initially preached in his earthly ministry. And we've seen that before. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's what's going to make also so arresting and alarming when Jesus opens his righteous lips in the New Testament and addresses the divine judgment of hell to individuals and their need to be saved from it. So what exactly did Jesus teach on this subject of hell? Well, the preaching of Jesus Christ reveals, first of all, number one, that hell is a place of God's just judgment. It is a place of God's just judgment. And here in Matthew chapter 10, after Jesus sends out his disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And by the way, the only way you get into the kingdom is having a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, a righteousness that God gives you. He reminds these believers... Verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy 
both soul and body in hell. You see that word destroy, apulamai, means to destroy or ruin. But please know, we're not talking about the loss of being, but the loss of well-being. It's used in the New Testament of the ruin of someone or something for a useful purpose or function. Like the ruin of a wineskin, but the wineskin still exists. The ruin of food that perishes. The ruin of a life destroyed by the love of money. For you see, according to the first law of thermodynamics, the law of energy conservation, everything that exists continues to exist, just in a different form. And that's true with the physical, let alone the spiritual, as we think of the immortality of the soul. And if you notice the word in here, in the locative case, indicates that hell is a location, a place, a place of God's just judgment, which is the only kind of justice that a holy God can exact upon those who break his laws and deserve such judgment. Now, while it's handy, look at Matthew chapter 11. And we pick it up in verse 20. Then he, Jesus, verse 20, began to rebuke the cities, literal places, in which most of his mighty works, these miracles had been done, because they didn't repent. They didn't change their mind and embrace him as the Messiah. Woe to you, Chorazin, a literal city. Woe to you, Bethsaida, a literal place. For if the mighty works which were done in you, in that location, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, in literal places, they, the people thereof, would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, literal places, in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, literal city, who are exalted to heaven, literal place, will be brought down to Hades, literal place. For if the mighty works which were done in you, locationally, had been done in Sodom, locationally, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Note the day of judgment here is connected with the literal place called Hades. You see, when we're talking about hell, we're talking about a literal place that has certain qualities or conditions that exist in it. That's why go with me to Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, the Lord Jesus is rebuking the religious leaders of his day. And he pronounces seven woes upon these leaders. And look with me at verse 33. He says, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? That word condemnation is a legal term. It's talking about a sentencing in a courtroom. For you see, when we're talking about hell, we're talking about the just judgment of a holy God in light of his holy standards having been violated. And you see the word condemnation is used there in reference to these religious leaders who were religious but not regenerate. But you see, dear friends, the planet never started that way. We recognize that God created everything good. And in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve enjoyed this wonderful relationship with God in which he, they walked with God in the coolness of the day. And yet, because God did not want a robot, he said, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, the tree which is in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Dying, you will die. Dying spiritually, you will die physically. And we know that's exactly what he promised. And when God makes a promise, he always keeps his promise. For you see, God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And yet we know the rest of the story, don't we? 
how they, Eve chose to eat the forbidden fruit, gave it to her husband, he did eat, and immediately the relationship with God was broken, though they continued to exist. Spiritual death had occurred, and the physical death process began. And as a result, they now began to hide from God with a sense of guilt and shame. And therefore, Paul wrote in Romans 5, therefore, just as through one man, sin into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. And eventually, you and I came along, and the verdict is no different. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And yet, while Jesus teaches us that hell is a place of God's just judgment, it's also true, Ezekiel 33, 11, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And that is why before this chapter is over, having pronounced these condemning woes upon these religious leaders, what do we see Jesus doing in verse 37? He's weeping over Jerusalem. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hand gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Notice, he wanted, but they weren't willing. His desire was to gather them. His desire was to save them. But they were not willing. It doesn't say they weren't able. They were willing. Because again, God wants a volitional relationship. But in doing so, there is responsibility and accountability to God. Are you willing? By the way, do you ever weep over the lost condition and destiny of the lost out of genuine concern for souls the Lord Jesus did why because man of sorrows what a name for the son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim hallelujah what a savior next we observe the preaching of Jesus Christ which reveals to us that hell is an already prepared place. An already prepared place. And while it's handy, go to Matthew 25. The context is the sheep and goat judgment that transpires when the Lord Jesus comes back in all his second coming glory to set up his kingdom. Those on the right are blessed. Those on the left are cursed. And we pick it up in Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me. Notice the sense of separation, not annihilation. You cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see that word prepared there? It means to make something ready, to prepare it. And it's in the perfect tense. It was prepared in the past and remains Prepared to this day. You know what is so interesting about that? Is that exact same Greek word is used in John 14. Where in the upper room discourse, the Lord Jesus on the eve of his crucifixion says to his disciples these words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. See, both a place in heaven is now prepared for believers in Christ, just as a place in hell is already prepared. The question simply is, which one is your destiny? A third truth about hell that we learn from the lips of the Lord Jesus is that hell 
was originally prepared for the devil and his angels. Originally prepared for the devil and his angels. And we just read that in Matthew 25, 41. Depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice how the cursed are going to experience the same destiny as the devil and his angels. Called everlasting fire. For you see, God originally created the angels. They were in fellowship with him. But then Lucifer rebelled. A third of the angels followed him. We call them demons. And while they are not in hell today, for Satan walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, we're told in Revelation 20, verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. By the way, they were thrown in a thousand years earlier and they're still there. No such thing as annihilation. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And unfortunately, those who are cursed will experience that same kind of punishment. For you see, the fourth thing we learn about hell regarding the, from the Lord Jesus Christ is that hell is the place of everlasting punishment. While, right here in Matthew 25 and verse 46, and these, the unrighteous, will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now you see that word everlasting? It's the word ionios. You see the word eternal here? It's the word ionios. It's the same word. They just translated one everlasting, the other eternal. That means the punishment will be the same duration as the life. If hell is not eternal, neither is eternal life with the Lord forever. And by the way, this was spoken from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. Was he wrong? Are the critics and redefiners right? Never. And notice there's only two options, everlasting punishment or everlasting life. No purgatory involved. But if, while it's close, look at Matthew 26 for a moment and verse 24. For here the Lord Jesus is speaking about Judas. He was never saved. He had never trusted in Christ. He had never received eternal life. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, The Son of Man indeed goes just as is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Now watch this. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. I ask you a question. If upon death, People are eventually annihilated. What difference would it make if they had been born or not? They wouldn't have existed or they will not exist. There is no difference. And by the way, did Jesus Christ die just to save you from annihilation, which deprecates the value of his death? Or did he die to save you from an eternal retribution called everlasting punishment. Now I know there are those who say, well, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? And this fails to factor in his justice. But the greater issue is how can a holy God allow anyone to go to heaven? Because we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the only way of escape is through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, heaven is for real and so is hell. Jesus said so. The fifth thing we see about the preaching of Jesus regarding hell is that hell is a place for the unrighteous or unbelieving, including religious people. Including religious people. If you look back at Matthew 23, just a couple chapters to your left, you will see again in this condemnation of the religious leaders of his day, who were trusting their own righteous works to save them instead of him alone. We pick it up in verses 14 and 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense. You make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive, now watch this, greater condemnation. 
Are there degrees of punishment? I believe the answer is yes. At least mentally in some kind of way, or torment-wise in some kind of way. Greater is a degree word. For religious leaders who have led others astray. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, one convert, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ was not practiced on this occasion in positive thinking. He would have not made the hour of power and other places like that, saying words like this. You say, why did he say this of them? Because they had rejected him and relied on their works. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, listen to what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And the will of the Father is to trust in the Son. Many will say to me, in that day, what day? The day of judgment. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, never had a relationship with you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He doesn't deny that they did these things, but at the end of the day, notice, what are they relying on? Their own works, and not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to God's mercy, he saves us. So look now with me at Matthew 21. And right after the Lord Jesus told the parable of the son who initially didn't do what the father wanted, but then changed his mind while the other said he was going to do it, but didn't do it, we pick it up in verse 31. Which of the two did the will of the father? Now remember, that's the phrase we just saw in Matthew 7:21. They said to him, the first, Jesus said to them, now watch this, Assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. And he's saying this to these religious leaders. For John, John the Baptist came to you in the way of righteousness, and your problem was you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Notice what is the whole issue is one of faith, believing what the word of God says. And you see, these religious people rejected Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, because they didn't want to humble themselves. They didn't want to admit that their works could not save them, because they were banking on their own righteousness. Instead of embracing their depravity, embracing their lostness, and putting their faith in the one and only Savior God ever provided. A sixth truth we see from the lips of the Lord Jesus regarding hell is that hell is the place of utter abandonment and isolation. Utter abandonment and isolation. While you're in Matthew, go to chapter 8 with me. Matthew chapter 8. And here the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the future kingdom on earth, like into a banquet. And he has just healed this centurion's servant. We pick it up in verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, by this Gentile Roman centurion. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, the Jews who had been offered the kingdom, will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, he's talking here about Jewish unbelievers experiencing outer darkness, a place of isolation, a place of abandonment, a place of indescribable pain, 
weeping and gnashing of teeth and exclusion from the entire messianic kingdom and, and instead experiencing this horror of separation from God forever. Jesus refers to this in Matthew 13 as well when he says, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. He also says later in Matthew 13, 49 and 50, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked, the unsaved, from among the just, the justified, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You see, fire pictures God's holy actions and judgment, and, and therefore this outer darkness is a place of isolation, of abandonment, of no fellowship with God or man. A horrible, horrible description of the horrors of hell for those who could have been saved. A seventh thing, thing that our Lord taught us regarding hell is that hell is a place of unquenchable fire. Of unquenchable fire. In fact, in Mark chapter 9, verse 42 through 45, this is what he said. Whatever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Quenched. And the word for hell here is the word Gehenna. It's found 12 times in the New Testament, 11 times from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see outside of Jerusalem there was this valley of Hinnom in which there was this massive dump that was constantly on fire where they would put garbage or they would put the bodies of dead criminals and people like that there. And he took that very place, literal place, and he used it to describe for them an illustration of the realities of an eternal hell in which he talks about unquenchable fire, where the worms do not die. A terrible picture of extremely painful and the unending reality of Gehenna, also called the Lake of No wonder our Lord, number eight, preached that hell is a place to avoid. Hell is a place to avoid. In fact, he says in Luke chapter 3, verse 7, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Something worth fleeing from. And in fact, the sense of the judgment of God upon our lives should cause us to flee to Christ and Him alone, our city of refuge. Now if you turn with me to Luke chapter 13, we see the Lord warning the lost regarding hell, Gehenna, or perishing, per se. In Luke chapter 13, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans, Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Apparently, while they were sacrificing, Herod came in and he just slaughtered these people. It was a horrific violation of human life and murder. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than other Galileans because they suffered such things? Isn't that the tendency we are prone to think? 
Isn't that what even the disciples said regarding in John 9, the person who was blind? So who sinned, he or his parents? In other words, they got what they deserved. Not understanding Adam's sin and the curse and putting it into balance. So were they worse sinners? Verse 3, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He said the word repent means to change your mind. To come to grips with the fact that as a sinner before a holy God, you need a savior. Your works cannot save you. Change your mind and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The word repent doesn't mean sorrow for sin or turning from sin. As God in the Old Testament repented and he had no sin. And while the word repent can be used in a context for a believer to change their mind about their sin, the issue at the point of salvation isn't an issue of sin. It's an issue of what do you think about the son who died for your sins. Verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell. Apparently they fell in what we would call a natural disaster. And he killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Does he mean just physically die? No. Because everyone's going to physically die. Perish in the sense of perish and be separated from God. Perish and experience the just judgment of God in hell. That's the idea he's after. And therefore, Jesus warns about this. He wants you to avoid perishing. In fact, what does the Bible say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting. And that's why the ninth thing we see from our Lord's lips regarding hell is that hell is the surprising destiny for some. If you go with me now to the book of Luke chapter, it should say 16 there, not 12. Chapter 16. We have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. There are some who believe this is a parable. I have not yet been persuaded by virtue of the fact that real names are used and real places are used. That is not normative at all in the parables of Christ. But this is a parable about two men who have one thing in common called death, and that's about all they have in common. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, here is... This poor man named Lazarus. We know his name. We know he's poverty stricken. We know he's probably lame. He's carried to the gate. And the contrast couldn't be more stark between him and the rich man inside who was eating, feeding himself sumptuously, enjoying all the pleasures of this life. Now keep in mind, in the Jewish mindset, To be rich was to be righteous. To be poor was to be sinful because the law said obey and you will be blessed physically. Therefore, if you're blessed physically, you must be obedient. You must be righteous. That's what they would think until verse 22. So it was that the beggar died, no surprise, and was carried Now, not to the rich man's gate, but carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. By the way, that's where the old black spiritual comes in. Swing low, sweet chariot. 
I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? A band of angels coming after me. That's where this comes from. That's what those black slaves looked forward to. They looked forward, because of faith in Christ, to heaven. Because they know their plot on earth was probably not going to change. On the other hand, the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Shocking. Not that both had died, but their destinies were so different. The rich man is in torment. The torment side of Hades, the underworld. Well, Lazarus is in his bosom. The place of blessing and fellowship and comfort. A place where Abraham is. And Abraham was justified by faith in the Lord apart from the law, ritual, and works. And thus so was Lazarus. He was a believer. And by the way, that's the only way to die. It's to die in the Lord and enter into the presence of God. You know, I preached a funeral on Friday, a believer from the range that I've known for 40 years. And when I visited him last weekend in the hospital here as he had had a stroke, I said, Gary, are you afraid to die? And he was. And I said, well, are you afraid about the possibility of dying soon? And he shook his head no both times. And it was very hard to understand on Saturday. I understood him better on Sunday. But on Saturday, I read him Romans 8, 38 and 39, and he couldn't hardly say any words, words but he got up. Amen. Because <laughs> no one and nothing will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. You know, as I think of Gary, I couldn't help but think of his own brothers who ridiculed him due to his faith in Christ. Pray for their salvation. So I did the funeral, and then I came back here to Duluth and went to visit a family in the hospital, a friend of mine who I've known for 40 years as well, and whose wife was soon to die. And they were believers in Christ as well, from Heritage Trail, and as I came off the elevators, I saw Dale. I began to talk with him. He was looking at a verse, and we began to talk about Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The Lord is with us to go through those times. And verse 6, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so would his wife who would die that night after taking off life support. But what comfort to be found in death. And then I made my way over to Miller Dwan to visit a man who about six weeks ago, probably around midnight, fell on his porch and wasn't found till 9 in the morning. in about 40 degrees below zero weather. And a believer saw him, called 911, came and got him. He's been in the hospital since. Now that was horrific, and he's not going to make it. He's probably not going to live too much longer. But in the process, these believers have visited him, given him the gospel. God saved. So I went to visit him, and in doing so, he just had this peace. In fact, his unsaved brother goes, I can't believe how peaceful he seems. Well, we know why. And you know, as horrific as that accident was, it's what God used to cause him to see a need to bring him to Christ. And what a joy to read scripture to him and pray and have him acknowledge the fact that he was saved. 
Because you see, dear friends, after you die, it's too late. For you see, the tenth thing we see about hell is that hell is a place without mercy. In Luke 16, 24, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But if you notice, was he asked mercy, the request is not met. There is no mercy in hell. And in fact, hell is a place of conscious torment. We read in verse 24, for I am tormented in this flame. One minute after someone dies, they will forever know the reality of conscious torment in Hades. Forever and ever. But did you realize, dear friends, that hell is a place of, of memory? It's a place of reasoning ability yet. We read in verse 25, but Abraham said, son... Remember, which apparently he could do, that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus received evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented, and Abraham believed he could reason that through. You know what this reminds me of? Of the fact that for the unsaved, this life is the best it gets. The worst is yet to come. But for the redeemed, this life is the worst it gets. The best is yet to come. But keep in mind that Jesus makes it clear here, there are no second chances. There are no post-mortem salvation conversions. For he makes it very clear, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. You see, prior to the death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, when individuals were redeemed and they died, they went to the paradise side of Hades while the unsaved died and they went to the torment side of Hades, and there was this great cult fix that was inescapable and impassable and unbridgeable, and that's why now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, and that's why we need to give the gospel to the lost now. Because when you die, your destiny is sealed forever. And it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment, not a second opportunity. And that's why hell, dear friends, is a place where the occupants do not want others to join them. At least the rich man didn't. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. I don't want them to join me. And when I hear people say, I don't mind going to hell, I'll just play poker with my friends, I'm thinking, there's no poker games. There's no, quote, friends, and you're in isolation, and you are in conscious torment, and they don't want you to come. And that's why Jesus made it clear that hell is a place God offers all salvation from. It can only be avoided by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. You see, 1 Timothy 2 makes it clear that God desires all people to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish. And yet, to avoid it, you've got to believe the word of God. For we read in Luke 16 now, at the end of this story, verses 29 through 31, and Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have the Old Testament. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be Persuaded, though one rise from the dead. 
You see, dear friends, if one isn't willing to take God at his word, as written on the pages of scripture, it's not a matter of seeing someone raised from the dead in order to get it. You see, the Lord Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And it was God's love that was demonstrated toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why on the cross he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the penalty for sin is death. Death is separation and therefore abandonment. And as a result, Christ was bearing the equivalent of our hell for us. And yet on the cross he cried out, to tell us die, it is finished, which means that our sins had been paid in full. And the proof is that on the third day, God raised him from the dead. So that Revelation 1 says, I am he, Jesus said, that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And watch this. Jesus has the keys of hell and of death. He's got the keys. And the key is really the gospel. How Christ died for our sins according to the scripture that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. And therefore, it's not a matter of trying to get your good to away your bad, for the Bible is clear, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's why God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came. But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in the son, option number one, has everlasting life. He who does not believe the son, option number two, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And that is why the Bible says... These things I have written to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, K-N-O-W, know that you have eternal life. You know, I was told at the funeral on Friday that a believer shared with me yesterday that a row or two in front of her, this couple were looking at each other as I'm going through the gospel like, and when I got to this verse and I said, K-N-O-W, no, he says, wow. He looks at his wife and just puts his hands in his head. Incredible. But true. And that's why, in a sense, the unbeliever condemns himself or herself. Because the pardon has been offered, the pardon has been paid for, but it's got to either be accepted or rejected. Jesus said, he who rejects me and does not receive my words, including that on hell, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. See, dear friends, you can argue if you must. You can reject it if you will. However, God will have the last word. And Jesus is saying to you today, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful word. And indeed, it is bittersweet to know you are holy and just and you have every right to condemn each of us to hell. For we have all sinned and fall short of your glory. We embrace that. But that's why we're so thankful that you loved us and sent your son, came and died for us on the cross and rose again to save us. And we needed to flee the wrath to come by fleeing to Christ and putting our faith in him alone. And if there's anyone here who's never been saved, may today, right now, they flee to Christ. They put their faith in him. They come to him. 
knowing they're undeserving, not trying to measure up, realizing they deserve your judgment, but believing that Jesus died in their place for their sins, making full payment for them, and rose again to give them eternal life, and they accept this gift by faith in him alone before it's too late. And may this reality also motivate us as believers, one, to be so grateful for your grace, so thankful for the work of Christ, so appreciative for what he accomplished, and so willing and bold by your grace and desirous of others to hear the message of the gospel before it's too late for them too. So we pray to this end as well. And thank you, for Jesus has spoken, and we know it's true, in Jesus' name.